In this video, let's take a close look at the top five handheld devices with the budget. We also call this, let's say the top five game console 640x480. This is actually what they all have in common. Different prices, different kind of form factors and different overall experiences. In this video, I just wanna give you my personal top five, which one do I really love? Watch the full video because maybe there is some information in it that you're missing out that will give you the wrong choice. But because maybe my number one will not be your number one. Nevertheless, let's take a close look at it and let's go. The game console, it comes with different kind of, let's say, price ranges, different kind of emulation performance. Nevertheless, which one is the best one for you? Hereby, my personal top five for this year. For the number five position, I'm going to give this to the 640x480 game console, also called the Gamebox Game Console X6. The quality, that is one of the things that we do see some differences. If you don't buy an Embernic or let's say a Pau Kitty is a different story, but let's say an Embernic, you do have an, quite a nice consistency when it comes to the overall quality. And with this weird kind of a brand, you never know. So first of all, we're going to get two analog joysticks. And they're not Halo or digital joysticks. They're just a simple analog joystick you find in your Switch. And I find it very cool having this nice color pattern. Yeah, the, the, the feel, you can see that it has a lot of wiggle room and the travel of these things are absolutely horrible. And if you're just going to be playing and yeah, you know, this is not the best configuration when it comes to the buttons. And then at the front, we're having to select the menu and the start buttons. They're just micro switched. At the left side, we're going to having the on and off switch over here and the reset if you have any problems. With the X60, we went for only two back buttons, so there's a quite interesting and very strange choice. The display they are using is in 3.5 inches, uh, within the resolution of 640x480, or that's actually what the specification says on the box, or on the website itself. But when it comes to the display, there are a little bit of a couple of things I don't find that cool. So first of all, when you're looking at the display, this thing has a massive, be freaking annoying bezel. But beside the bezel, we're also having the X6, logo in front of it. And the viewing angle is the same with all the previous X-Series devices. They're not IPS panels, but I guess that's what you're going to be getting for what you're paying for. Now we're having a slightly better menu than before, but what the support is, we're going to get Super Famicom, Mega Drive, NES, MAME Arcade, and of course Neo Geo, Game Boy Advance, Game Boy Color, CPS has a Super Nintendo Control, no idea why, and we're having another Famicom, Game Boy, and the SMC, and of course the SMD. But I'm just going to be honest with you, this sounds absolutely horrendous, and the emulation, it's just still a huge problem when it comes to Super NES. And I find it a little bit of a bummer, because this is not necessary when it comes to these cheaper devices. Let's get into the gameplay. You do see a lot of screen tearing going on. They also map the second joystick to the front facing buttons, another thing they're also doing with these cheaper devices. So next up, let's see if we can actually have an okay emulation performance with Mega Drive, but also here we're going to get a shitload of screen tearing. And I have the feeling that it doesn't run on the full speed, where the audio is the same problem with a lot of emulators, or emulators at least, the cheaper handheld emulators. You can hear that there's no stereo sound coming out of this thing. Okay, so next up, let's try another cool game. And yep, the NES, every single freaking like game I'm booting up has a shitload of screen tearing. Another thing I wanted to check out is if they implemented turbo buttons, but they didn't do that with this particular emulator. Because with the NES, you're only going to need two buttons. Okay, next up, let's try MAME, just to see how it actually runs, but so far I can see there is no screen tearing going on, and the overall emulation part is quite nice. So, when it comes to the D-pad, the positioning, I really hate it, but when I'm actually playing... So, where we're going to see a lot of great performance with MAME, I'm quite disappointed to see that they completely dropped the ball with Neo Geo Arcade MBS. You can just hear the audio is not like it's supposed to be. But the overall gameplay, it's still, let's say, playable, but, but this is actually not the way how you want to experience these old school games. But the X6, I was surprised seeing the old school software again. 
And I can tell you that I'm disappointed that they still didn't fix the issues that we have with the previous models. The Game Console X5 is absolutely a dirty cheap product and that's one of the reasons I wanted to put it in this list. But take consideration, it does have many problems with emulation. There are a couple of platforms that does run okay, but the overall quality is not the best out there. And that's also the reason why I'm going to put it on the number 5 position. For the number 4, let's take a close look at the Game Console. This is the 007. And yep, this is a device. Does have a double feeling with me, but let's take a close look at it and what are we actually getting with this and why it's number four. When pressing it, you can maybe see it in the camera. It's bending fairly easy. So need to be very careful, careful with that because it's going to be absolutely scratch sensitive. The form factor, I must say that I was quite surprised seeing this at first on the picture because I knew already it's going to be absolutely great. So, and I mean, particularly looking at the back part over here, the round shapes will give you absolutely way better comfortability than your typical handheld. So one of the configurations I love. It has a slight angle to it. The travel, it's quite long, but not to a point that it's going to be annoying. And also in combination, when you're just moving around, it feels nice. It doesn't have the cheap click to it. And the resistance, it's okay. I would love to see it a little bit, let's say, more like or less of a or less of a travel and a less of a resistance. But I'm very curious about this, how it actually plays. It's kind of cool that they implemented two joystick at the bottom, and in my opinion, this is one of the best configurations. The joystick have a very nice feature with some LEDs around them. When you're just going to be pressing them, they will light up. That's kind of cool. I love it. And what is even more of a surprise, the ABXY are just huge buttons. And the touch itself is also very pleasant. They have an absolutely great travel, they have a little bit of a wiggle to it, not a bad thing. And it has like a very nice round shape on top, so that makes it very comfortable to play. It takes quite a long time to actually boot up, but it will not boot up in your typical Emmy Alex software. No, not at all. But it looks similar. In the main menu, here we find all kinds of different emulators. Sony plays 4 and a 64. I will mainly focus on, like I said, a high-end system just to see how it actually runs. But I can tell you, the old school stuff runs just fine on the device like this with a rock chip. But the overall menu, this is made for people who don't want to tinker and mess around with all kinds of settings. Okay, so first off, let's try some main. Where I'm not going to be surprised that it actually runs great. And that's because... Next up, let's some 8 bit. This is a game that I've played so much as a child. It's so much fun. And how many different like Bombermans we're having nowadays is absolutely crazy. And I can't get enough of Bomberman. Okay, move on to the Super NES. Okay, I lowered the audio because it may be easier with recording, but let's crank it all the way up. The downside is, if you want to have a different resolution with some emulators, there is no way of getting into the filter options and etc. But when it comes to N64, these devices are not great at all in my opinion. Yep, they will run a couple of games, but you can already see from the internet, it's going to be absolutely a mixed overall shenanigans. I'm not getting even into the freaking game, it's already stuttering like crazy. So with N64 we're not there yet. It's interesting to see that we're having budget devices now with N64, where back in the day we had quite expensive devices that only had the option to run it, but that's cool. There's also no option. So far I can see getting into the PPSSP AM later. So far so good. It does look slightly different than your normal PlayStation Portable because the, the resolution and the screen size is not the same. That's the reason why we're going to get black bars on top and bottom. The D007 Plus Edition, it's kind of interesting piece of tech if you may ask me. Runs on Android, has a very nice interface, has a lot of games that we can actually play with it with this rock chip. But when you're looking at the competition, there are way better options out there. 
The 007 is maybe just a cheap device like the X6, but in my opinion it's way better in many different ways. Having four shoulder button that doesn't really feel that bad, having very nice resistance and overall emulation performance. It does have a lot of stuff that can actually be played on here. The ABXY buttons feel quite nice and it is quite comfortable. Yeah, and I must say that the way how it displays and of course the light up, let's say rings around the joysticks are pretty damn cool. It's a nice gimmick. Nevertheless, it's very limited in some ways, and of course the thick bezel, man, that doesn't really help. It looks kind of ugly, but beside that, yeah, that's the reason I just wanted to put it on my number 4 position. In the next position, I wanted to check out the number 3, and that is the R35S. And I don't know if you're going to be agreeing with me about this. Let me know in the comments, I always love your feedback about this. So this is a device that I do have a love and hate relationship with, because this thing has a lot that you can actually play with it. But yeah, when it comes to the shell, uh, this was not my first choice. And also the reason why I'm going to put this on my number 3. But it is, in my opinion, higher quality and the overall emulation is way better than the previous number. So this game system, the R35S, comes with a 3500 milliamp battery. And we're going to have the configuration of four back buttons. So the overall, let's say, configuration is something that we have seen before. What I find quite interesting already, we're going to get two similar Nintendo Switch joysticks with a click. Select start with micro switch and the FN button or a function key. And what I don't really like already is that we're going to have four buttons here at the corner. The same for the D-pad. And the way I don't like this because you need to cramp up your hands very strangely. Maybe due of my size of my hands with smaller hands is going to be more comfortable. So when it is with the compatibility of the different systems, so this device is absolutely great. In combination with the piece of software we're going to see here, we're having all kinds of very cool devices. But when we're going to have the most struggles, it's going to be PlayStation Portable. And you know, N64, you know the same stuff that we have seen many times before. Dreamcast is a system that will have a hit or miss, but particularly I want to focus on all kinds of stuff. Pew, it's a rock chip. The 3326, that's a quad-core ARM 64-bit Cortex-A35 CPU that runs on 1.5 GHz, only 1 GB of RAM, that is actually DDR3L, 3.5 inches of a display, it is an IPS full viewing angle, and that's absolutely true, with a resolution of 640 by 480. Nevertheless, they have some option for Wi-Fi capabilities, 2.4 and 5 GHz, and when it comes to the games, there is so much to play. But let's start off with some PlayStation 1 emulation. These devices are absolutely great. And in combination with this amazing display and the resolution, the PlayStation game come absolutely to life. But when it comes to comfortability, here we're going to have, in my opinion, the first problem. I cannot really say that I am enjoying this game. Because in consideration, you're going to need the back buttons a lot. And I don't find it really comfortable to play with these weird back buttons. You need to press them quite hard. And the positioning is also not great. So, oh man, my hands. Oh. But where, the, where this particular device is perfect for is old school gaming. In combination with this beautiful display, in my opinion, this is an absolute great experience. We're going to combine playing with the analog stick and the button at the right bottom corner the right joystick is not configured whatsoever I did see sometimes it's been configured to the let's say the front facing buttons but that's not the case over here but let's move on with a different system the system and this is going to be the super nes due of the resistance i need to press the d-pad quite hard to get around here in the playing field but not to the point that it's going to be quite annoying but i prefer to play with the joystick at this point Let's start with Bug Bumble on the N64, a game that's been let's say, test benching on a lot of different devices and oh boy, yeah, the glitching is not a good start. But it got one of the best intros ever. Oh, that audio speaker. When it goes loud, but it sounds absolutely crap. And you're pressing it to the 90% on. Okay, this is a game that we're going to need every single freaking joystick. And navigation is going to be otherwise impossible. But if you're looking in device that needs to play all kinds of Game Boy games, 
or NES, Super NES, you name it. I think this is absolutely one of those devices that you can consider. But, but another thing you need to consider is that where we have amazing overall performance and emulation nowadays with these cheaper devices, and if you just want to experience some old school nostalgia games, oh yeah, this is absolutely a lot of fun. But even this thing is a single speaker, we have all the sound effects and everything sounds amazing. But coming back to the D-pad, I've noticed that I need to press it really hard. So the other thing I wanted to check out is Sega Dreamcast, but here we're going to push it to the limit in my opinion. I also noticed a lot of difference with the audio freaking level. I can hear that it stutters. If you're looking at the positive and the negative parts of the device, so first of all, I think the negative thing is, I just don't going to start off it. I don't like the form factor of this thing, me personally. I find it not really comfortable and we have a gazillion poor options out there with different devices. The R35S is, in my opinion, a very nice looking device. Where I don't like the D-pad, I freaking hate this thing. Also the placement. This thing is way too small for my hands. And of course, not even to forget the very clicky back buttons. This device does have some overall good performance. And that was the thing I was really surprised about. And maybe you don't even play with D-pad and you just love the analog sticks. And this thing works very nicely. You know, and that's the reason I'm going to put this a little bit higher on my list because this, this feels so much more durable and so much more quality than the 007. So on the next position, it's going to be the R36S. In my opinion, the improvement of the previous model. Yep, and this particular product did it right in many different ways. What do I mean with this? It's very simple. It's also the placement and all the other things. So let's just chat about it and I'll show you why I put this on my number two position. But all fun and game and good resolution is a 640x480. It's absolutely amazing. But what are we going to see when it comes to the overall performance, but also how it comes with the overall controls. This device has a very nice form factor when it comes to the, the say the thickness, but also the way how the buttons are placed. So first of all, I'm very glad they're putting the D-pad in the left top corner because I am a D-pad guy and I mostly play with the D-pad. But when it comes to the touch, that was also like a very huge surprise. The form factor of the D-pad is quite nice. It doesn't have like a huge curve, but I must say that normally I really love when having a curve, but overall when you're looking at the way how it feels, it got a very nice resistance and just I'm very satisfied with it. But we're still able to use the two joysticks over here. Both are similar to the Nintendo Switch in combination with the click underneath. Then in the middle, we're going to find the select start and the FN button is basically mapped to the special menu if you want to make a quick load and quick save. With the ABXY button, I am personally not the biggest fan of these things because they are so tiny. We have seen devices with bigger buttons and they are so much more comfortable most of the time. Unfortunately, this is something we do see a lot when these devices, but when it comes to the overall touch, I must say they don't feel really bad. I have seen myself some really horrible ABXY buttons and these were not bad, especially when you're looking at the money you're paying for this device. And last but not least, then we're going to see at the back an very nice configuration of four buttons. But the thing is, what I don't like about these things is that you need to press them very hard. In the inside, you can already see that they are basically touching the micro switch underneath directly. There's no membrane, so you don't have nice, very nice feedback. Another cool thing that you don't see very often with these devices, they can remove the back cover. Here you can get into the battery compartment and just remove it fairly easy. Specification wise, it's quite an interesting piece of hardware. 3.5 inch display, it's absolutely a beautiful display with a resolution of 640 by 480. The CPU is a Rockchip 3326 64 bits, that is actually in quad core Gore-Tex A35 running on 1.5 GHz. Is that we do have all kinds of emulation possibilities. First off, let's start with some PlayStation Portable. You will see that there are actually some problems with the emulation performance. You will find some hiccup here and there. Let's hold the device differently. All the buttons have, been, buttons have been configured correctly. So one of the issues I've noticed a lot with PlayStation, it's not the overall bad emulation performance, no, it's actually pretty great on this. But the downside to these devices is that they are putting files on here or you accidentally are like ripping your files wrong and you don't have any audio whatsoever. Doesn't matter for this review, I just wanted to showcase how fast it loads and actually also what you can play. 
The thing is, like, you don't have any background in music, so the soul of the game is absolutely gone. Loading times are of course significantly faster than when you're having the official game on your PlayStation. But the performance is absolutely great. But let's move on to some Neo Geo arcade gaming. And the overall performance is pretty damn great on this. If you just want to play some old school games, this is just more than enough. Absolutely great to see this game again. And it fits perfectly when it comes to the display. I did complain about the speaker itself, that we don't have an, let's say, duo speaker, but it doesn't sound, let's say, super bad. The stereo effect is here, something I really miss with a lot of these, let's say, cheaper devices. We have reached the point when it comes to the cheap devices. You have amazing, like, performance, and also, when it comes just the way how it looks, it is great. Absolutely, and really, a nostalgia seeing these games. But let's push this device to the limit and let's choose some Dead Alive 2 with the Sega Dreamcast. And oh yeah, it stutters. It struggles big time with Dreamcast. And that's one of the reasons that I wish they just like optimizes these devices more and don't even like say it isn't able to run because this is in my opinion completely Unplayable. Also, the Game Boy Advance. This is not a perfect overall resolution, but still, maybe it's not pixel perfect. I think it still looks really great on this device. I'm gonna give you an example of what you're going to see in the emulation of the N64. Cruising user is actually in quite a nice benchmark because not a lot of stuff will actually run this perfectly or at a decent frame rate, so we can just enjoy this old school classic one. Next up, let's take a close look at some Super NES, because it's not all that bad, of course. If you just want to enjoy some old school games, this is absolutely an amazing piece of equipment. Also the audio itself, I'm still surprised by it, how good it actually sounds for one single speaker. I think it's due of the single speaker being a front-facing speaker. Reaching a point that we do get a lot of performance for not a lot of money. The form factor of this device is absolutely amazing, where I'm very happy with the D-pad, it plays great. The back buttons, hmm, that's such great to be honest, that's something these should improve in the next model. And of course when it comes to the tiny speaker at the front. It's front facing, it sounds good, but I personally prefer to have two to get in my opinion a better audio experience. Besides the very nice looking translucent like purple color like say case, this thing is absolutely great in many ways. The D-pad was fitting so much better than the R35. The ABXY buttons are placed on my position that I love to play like every single game. The display looks great and when you're just looking at everything it was amazing what kind of overall performance you're getting for your money. Of course it's not perfect and that's the reason I'm putting it on the number 2. And the main reason is the D-pad, I'm just gonna be honest. For the number 1 I have I have just decided to put the XU10 on here. I know some of you said that it is going to be slightly more expensive than the previous ones. And I think for that minor difference, this thing just deserved the number one position. And yeah, when you're looking at it, what you're getting, oh man, this thing, there are so many good positive things about it. Where most of the devices, when it comes to the form factor, are not really comfortable, this is, in my opinion, the right size. Also, the form factor is completely different than the previous models we've reviewed here. I mean, when looking at the bottom part, here we can even see that there are different, like, round shapes going on. And it will give you an extra thing when it comes to, like, being more comfortable than the previous models I've reviewed here on the channel. That also includes when it comes to minor details. First of all, when you're looking at the back over here, we find this very nice edge, but it is very interesting because you can just leave your hands underneath and we're having like a more comfortable situation going on. But when it comes to the aesthetic parts, also here we can find all kinds of new things. For example, we're having these tiny edges over here. It doesn't have any function so far I know, but it looks kind of cool to be honest. Then at the front we're going to give a very strange looking D-pad, but I must say that I'm very pleased with this. So first of all, when you're looking at the way how it looks, it does have a very nice angle, and if you just want to like, say, move around, it's very comfortable. And I'm very surprised, I think similar to the PlayStation 4 controllers back in the day. 
but also the touch itself it has a very nice let's say overall resistance and a very nice feedback and we're going to have two joysticks and they're similar to the nintendo switch and yep they have also the click underneath but how about the ABXY button? Because here we do have some differences when it comes to different devices. So first of all, the dust got, got have a, the same very nice, let's say short travel, but the nice click underneath. But if you want to use them, they are very comfortable. And this is due of the, let's say distance between them, but also the way how it looks when it comes to the top part. Because if you're having more of the Nintendo Switch buttons, they are pretty damn awful, but this feels just very nice if you just want to play your games. With this XQ10, we do have select and start in the middle, and it's absolutely in great position. It does have a very nice touch to it, with some of the devices that I've reviewed before having micro switches underneath, where I'm personally not a big fan of. Last but not least, we're having the tiny speaker in the middle. The overall quality of the display is absolutely looking great. And in combination with the very thin bezel and no logos, this is looking pretty damn nice in my opinion. In the next part, I just wanted to do a side-by-side -side comparison with all of the three displays to showcase which one is the better looking one. And from this point, you can just see that already the 35 and 36 are very similar to each other, where the XU10 is a completely different color, more of a greenish color tint to it. And in my opinion, I don't know, it's going to be a bad thing. This is more of the case if you're looking all of three of them next to each other. Up close, here you can just actually see that the 35 and the 36 are having some differences. Where I find the 35 looking slightly better in my opinion. Here you can just see the green is more vibrant. So even that the uh, 36 is absolutely looking great compared with XU10. That even the 35 model over here, you can see it how much, how the details of the castle in the background. And how everything looks so much better on the 35. So let's also compare the 35 over here against the XU10. So when it comes to the displays, the XU10 is just looking so much different. Not in a super bad way, but still in a way that I'm thinking, hmm, why does this 35 look so good? But what I do find when it comes to the R35 at the left and the R36 at the right, it is that actually when you're just seeing the XU4 in real life and just playing on it, I already mentioned it, you don't really notice it. And oops, there we go again. <laughs> but the thing is, is that when you're looking at this middle screen, it is so much more comfortable to look at. And then, I don't know, it's going to be, that isn't thing I'm having, but I find it even because of the sharpness of both displays are so much better, the XU10. It's more of a relaxing to look at. But what can we find at the back? And of course, there are the back buttons and the on-off switch and the reset. It's quite an interesting configuration. They are always on top or at the side, and now we're having one at the back. A very interesting and very smart choice. So here we can just hold it for a couple seconds for booting it up. When it comes to the touch, you need to put some pressure in, but not to the point that it's really annoying. In general, I am not a huge fan of these back button configurations, but yeah, there is no other way solution for this when you're needing more buttons. So one of the interesting things is just the placement and the feel. The R35 and R36, they have like this very annoying, very huge resistance clicky buttons, where the XU10 has a micro switch, but the resistance is so much different. Of course, we're having the specifications list that is similar to all the other devices we've reviewed. Think about the R35S or the R36S. It's a chipset they're basically using a lot on these budget devices, but does have a great overall performance with this Mali G31 and this Rock Chip 3326S. So where back in the day we had a lot of devices that needed tinkering and like a lot of medicine around and some knowledge about emulation. Now we do have these very cool Pandora's box looking devices that we can just scroll through the games and it is just super easy to use. Here at the right we can even see we're having the making the favorite list, so pressing the Y button. Or if you want to search a certain game you can just press X and here we can search a game. Super easy. But let's talk about the quick load and quick save function. And in my opinion, it works pretty damn great for most platforms. When choosing a certain games, here you can see I already have myself a quick load or a quick save, or we can make a quick load. So pressing this particular like screenshot, it will automatically load up into the game where it has been playing. But with devices like this, you can just play Sonic and other games without any problem. You can use the analog stick. I do notice the form factor of this device is very comfortable to play. No problem whatsoever with the audio, even though we're having one single speaker, they configured this perfectly. 
No audio delay that we have seen with cheaper devices back in the day. It works all perfect in my opinion. Amazing when it comes to the Game Boy Classic. Oh man, this is one of my favorite pinball games ever, man, on the Game Boy. But how about Nintendo DS? That's a system I got a lot of requests from checking it out. So when you want to play this system, it's going to be a little bit more, let's say, of a problematic. First of all, the overall emulation performance, I hear that there was some stuttering going on. But besides that, we can switch between the two displays by pressing the shoulder buttons. But if you don't want to have this, you can press the right joystick. Over here, we're going to have the two screens configuration that you can put horizontal and vertical mode. And even can switching if you want to. Let's move on to the 16-bit era with some Super NES and Desert Strike. But also, this looks absolutely amazing. No weird things going on. Alright, so next up, let's try some PlayStation Portable. And for the people who watch a lot of these videos, you know this is not going to be working like it should be. And that's why we're going to see a lot of these cheaper devices. We have some two-dimensional games that run just fine. Give an example, let's load up the save point that we had. And oh boy, it's going to be looking really bad. Look at this. It's absolutely like horrendous. Every setting has been set to like low or whatsoever. And this is absolutely not the way how you actually want to enjoy some PlayStation Portable with some God of War. Beside also having not the right resolution of display because we're having two black bars on bottom and top. You can see also weird things going on and this is absolutely not the way how you want to play it. They basically like squeeze everything out of the chipset in combination with the PPS and PP emulator. It's quite fascinating to see it actually running at a decent frame rate, but this is not the way how you want to play. When it comes to MAME, there's actually so much that we can play, but take consideration that Killing Rich 10 games or the Tekken MAME will not run on this device. It's just not powerful enough. But beside that, it doesn't spoil the fun because there's actually so much more that we can play. And when actually that's playing now the main game or beat em up, navigating through the stage, I can just realize how good this D-pad actually is. I cannot stop talking about it because it's that great. But let's move into the Sega Saturn, a platform you don't see often with cheap, 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 cheap devices. And I can tell you there's a reason for that, because they're not running that great with Sega Saturn. And let's take a closer look in the Sonic R and you can just hear and see that it runs absolutely garbage. Wow, it's so slow that the audio is faster than actually the visual part. <laughs> there we go. But what is interesting with this particular chipset that we do have the option to play some Sega Dreamcast. Also here it's possible to get a mixed overall performance, but with Sonic Adventure we do have an absolutely great overall performance that I can really enjoy this old school game. In combination with the resolution of the display, this game is in my opinion the way how we should play it. Where I review so many different handhelds nowadays, sometimes I feel quite annoyed by repeating myself because some of the cheaper devices have the same problems over and over again. The XU10 is absolutely a great example that you can actually find a hidden gem in all of these piles or invasions of overkill of devices from China. So actually, you can find this thing for not a lot of money sometimes in sales, but beside that point, the thing is, I love this thing, how it feels and just how it actually plays. The ABXY buttons were very pleasant to play with, but the D-pad especially, the D-pad was just amazing. I don't have, let's say, too much resistance, the form factor of it, and for me, it was such a pleasant experience compared with let's say all the other ones that have such a different shell it's a super comfortable way and of course the back buttons everything what i found quite unique of this is that we're having different placements of some buttons like the on off switch at the back but that's the reason i wanted to put this one on number one position maybe it's slightly expensive than like all the other models but for your money and the overall emulation performance it's not bad at all thank you all for watching consider subscribing hit that little bell and it would be great to see you in the next video